Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you, John, for the introduction, and thank you uh, generally to the IOTSF um, for inviting me to speak on behalf of ARM uh, at this talk. Um, the theme of this conference, the, the thing that John talked about, about AI, having really sort of broken out into the world and become a fundamental um, event, a, a fundamental change in our technology, really seems to be have caught the public imagination over the last year. As John alluded to, we've just come off the AI summit. Um, we've just come off, um, you know, there the being this AI safety summit in Bletchley Park. Um, pretty much every newspaper article that we read, every, um, uh, every, every time I open a newspaper, there's yet another piece saying AI is going to change the world, AI is going to destroy all the jobs. You've got the optimists like uh, Elon Musk talking about how you'll never have to work in the future because AI is going to do everything for you. Um, on the other hand, you've got the pessimists saying, I won't have a job in five years' time because AI is going to take everything away from me. And this all kind of reminds me a lot of, of the hype that existed in the mid-90s when the internet was starting out and e-commerce happened. Anyone who was around at that time will remember I mean, we think it kind of led up to the dot-com boom to a certain extent, was that people were, were really saying, oh, the, you know, the internet's going to change everything. All the jobs, everything is going to be completely different. And what everyone missed at that time, everyone assumed it was going to happen over two or three years. But what really happened was it took, what, 10, 15 years for what the futurologists were talking about in the mid-90s to take place. But when it did take place, Boy, did it happen. If you look back and think about the world back in the early 90s, the information poor world that we had then, when I remember as a schoolboy in the 80s, having to go to the library to go and look up an Encyclopedia Britannica if I wanted to know something. Now I just click away on my phone and it's everything I wanted to know and lots of other things are available to me at a click of a button. Um, the internet changed everything but it took longer than people expected. And the, the hype that existed when it first broke out was overplayed in the short term, but actually possibly underplayed in the long term. And my belief is that actually AI is going to go through much the same cycle. We've got incredible hype at the moment. It's going to destroy the world. It's going to transform the world. Lots and lots of people worrying about lots of different things. But um, in reality, the exp there will be a fundamental change to the way we work. We will all have to adapt to what is happening, and cybersecurity is going to be a big part of the things that have to adapt. We're going to have to be secure because everyone's going to be reliant on more and more AI systems. But equally, um, AI will challenge some of the assumptions that we've made in the past about security. Um, it will cause us to have to do new things. But at the end, again, also some of the things will be much the same as they've always been. So in my view, AI, ML, we'll come to the distinction between the two in a minute, is, is really a, it is a, one of these shifts that happen every few years from technology. It is going to be a significant difference. But it's not a reason for panic. It is a reason for planning. It is a reason to start really considering that the future is going to be different from the past. We are going to need different skills. We are going to need to, the existing skills we've got at the moment to be used better. Don't panic, but do plan for it. It is very tempting excuse me, um, to conflate artificial intelligence and machine learning. In reality, the underlying technology that all of this artificial intelligence is based on is machine learning. What's happened in the last couple of years is that that has started being put together uh, in new ways. And um, what we've really gone from is just this basic building block of, of machine learning and going on to um, it actually genuinely looking like it is artificially intelligent. Because for the last eight to 10 years, there's been a growing use of machine learning to analyze the world around us, to, to essentially to create understanding more and more neural, different types of neural networks have been developed to extract information from the world. Um, the obvious example of this, I mean, we've had various things, things like text recognition, but particularly image recognition. Image recognition, kind of the foundation of, of an awful lot of, 
of the uses of, of machine learning and artificial intelligence. The idea we, on the brink of autonomy in our cars, our cars are getting more and more intelligent. They're doing more for us. Um, they started off just being able to recognize um, uh, speed signs, uh, uh, speed limits, and so on. Now they can recognize where the roads are. They can recognize pedestrians walking to you. They'll start applying the brakes. And we're heading towards more and more autonomy. I think Mercedes relatively recently and now have level three autonomy out there, uh, which has actually got the ability to drive it up to 60 kilometers an hour with no hands anywhere near the steering wheel. And the amount of compute power needed there is immense, but it's all based on a huge amount of image recognition, which was kind of one of the, the foundations of um, you know, how you can use these new machine learning technologies. In the security space, we've seen a growing use of biometric security coming along um, with you know, voice recognition or um, fingerprint recognition or facial recognition, essentially trying to capture what we've always thought of are individual uh, unique properties that then can't be replicated. And of course, one of the challenges at AI, AI's brought that ability to use this security, and then instantly it's also starting to take it away from us. With voice recognition, I was, um, saw a talk recently which effectively demonstrated how incredibly well an AI system can reproduce somebody's voice uh, to an extent that you know, it gets the cadence, the timbre right, the timings, everything about them, it's almost indistinguishable. And that's obviously now going to be a threat as you can synthesize that to using voice recognition security. My bank offered me about a week after that the ability to enroll for voice recognition as, as the security for my payments. And I thought, not so much if it's as easy to fake with that, with the new AI systems. So what we see, as with all technologies, is it gives new opportunities, but it also gives new threats. All technologies end up being used for both good and for bad. Now, uh, John alluded to the fact that really it was about a year ago that ChatGPT broke onto uh, the public awareness and everyone said, um, oh my goodness, this is a real change. And it's interesting to reflect, what was the essence of that real change? The essence of that real change was that I think AI and machine learning moved from just doing analysis to really doing synthesis. That is to say that it would go from... Um, uh, it would go and create an entire ream of text. You could actually say to an AI system or to ChatGPT, write me a presentation on machine learning, and it would go and give you a huge amount of material. That creation, that generation, people talk about uh, GPT is a generative um, transformer technology. These... Um, uh, this ability for AI to go and generate is something that has kind of moved in the public consciousness, machine learning, from just being a bit of a tool to being something that really appears to be conscious. This appears to be, you know, this is a machine that can do what people can do. It really is, it has its own consciousness. Of course it doesn't. In reality, what, there is no consciousness behind this. It is just a very clever machine. It is actually all built on large amounts of matrix multiplication, large amounts of, of predicted weights, predicting outcomes, um, making decisions based on that. And that comes down to an awful lot of basic computation and an awful lot of memory accesses. A lot of the focus of, of AI has been, uh, when people talk about it in the press, have been about the large computation required for the training of things like large language models. Um, you know, people talk about you know, years of training or, or, uh, and huge numbers of machines, entire data centers given over to the training um, of these systems. And you're seeing very large super chips such as uh, NVIDIA's Grace Hopper uh, coming out, which um, you know, that combines up to 72 ARM CPUs with um, NVIDIA's H100 um, Tensor GPU brings that all together into one superchip as being you know, a really incredibly powerful computer for the purposes um, of being able to do the training. But once you've trained these networks, they've actually got to go out and be deployed. And at that point, it moves out of the data center out towards the edge of the network. 
there are lots of really good reasons why uh, inference, which is really the use of all of these nice trained AI machines, ML machines, it should be out on the edge of the network, uh, out in the Internet of Things, rather than concentrating in the data center. It, it scales much better because everyone is going to be doing it. The vast majority of computational cycles that will be spent associated with AI and ML will not be in the training. They will be in the inference. They will be out on the edge of the system, close to the users. Um, and that will be done uh, for reliability reasons, to be done for latency reasons. It will be done also for reasonably pragmatic reasons, such as the electricity bill will actually get paid for by the users, rather than all being concentrated in the data centers. So you're going to see um, machine learning, artificial intelligence, increasingly moving out from being a data center thing to being just part of the computation that we do in our phones, in our sensors, in our cameras, in our IoT endpoints, in our cars, all around at the edge of the network. And um, you know, that's, that is the fundamental direction it's going. And the distribution of this machine learning to the edge will bring both security benefits and security challenges. A key security benefit from moving machine learning to the edge is that effectively the raw data that all the thing is working on will stay on premise. It can be handled, it can be processed on premise. And that's surely got to be better uh, for security because it means that the businesses and the consumers will actually be able to be in control of their data. A really good example of this I came across relatively recently is this idea of, of uh, you know, how we can use artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, to help with things like healthcare crises. Uh, a depressing statistic is a very large proportion of elderly people, when they fall, they fall in places like bathrooms and bedrooms. And it's because they're getting up and bending over, and so their balance goes. That's the last place in the world you want a camera. And if that camera, in order to make sense of it, has to take pictures of your grandmother in her bath and scream that onto the internet, yes, you might be able, in principle, to secure it, but the long, we all know that the longer the chain of custody is, um, the, the harder it is to secure it. It's far better if you can actually do the processing of this at the edge of the network, inside the camera, where the camera will take this raw feed of pictures that you really don't want going anywhere else and extract from that the semantic information. There is a person lying down in a place that I really don't think there should be. I should send an alert. And all that then goes out into the world is the alert, not those more sensitive pictures. So this idea of by being able to localize the processing you do by putting the machine learning, the artificial intelligence out into the edge of the network creates an opportunity for security. But it's also really important, excuse me, um, it's really important that these systems can be trusted by the consumers. Um, and actually, all of the thinking about this exposes a really interesting trust dynamic uh, that actually exists. Uh, the I, the um, sorry, excuse me a second. The PSA certified 2023 security report showed that some 69% of technology decision makers—that's people like the people in this room—will consider security. They'll pay extra for security, or they'll look for the security credentials of the devices that they go and buy. But you're not ordinary consumers. If you actually go and poll um, um, the majority of ordinary consumers, DCMS came back with a, a statistic that something like one in five consumers think about security, look to understand what the security systems are. And there is a general um, expectation that just because something's up for sale means it must be secure. You may, you may think that's crazy, but that is actually the expectation that most consumers have got. But it's not really the reality there. And it is actually our job for everyone working in this industry to actually deliver to that expectation. Because if we're not doing that, there is really no excuses. People aren't going to say, oh, I, you mean I meant to understand about security? I just assumed it was going to be secure. People don't spend their time thinking about, most people don't spend their time thinking about um, is this secure enough? If they think it's up for sale, it must be good enough. Security is really a hygiene factor, not a motivator. And like all hygiene factors, you really only notice it at the point that it is missing. And that is a real challenge for all of us. 
for businesses, businesses are much more, of course, astute about, um, about security. Um, you know, they do have um, you know, chief security officers. They do have people who really understand uh, what security requires. And they, when they start thinking about putting their expensive train models out into the internet, or out onto the edge of the, um, onto the, edge of the network, um, they start thinking, well, wait a second, I've spent millions training this. This, this model that is going to be recognizing fallen over grandmothers will be, it, it has got my IP. I've spent an absolute fortune getting that to be the best it possibly can. The last thing I want is somebody being able to, to rip that off, to be able to take my model and reproduce it more cheaply because actually my intellectual property, my value, my USP is embedded in this model. So again, for businesses, it's going to be really, oh, I'm hopelessly over time, uh, it's going to be really important um, to, um, to offer systems that are more secure. Um, John waving at me it made me slightly concerned. Um, so come back to the fact that um, AI is much, much more than just uh, large language models running on data centers being trained that way. We've got a statistic at ARM, which we, we're pretty confident behind, which is that 70% of third-party applications uh, run ML on the standard CPU um, and make use of that rather than the using accelerators. I mean, it doesn't mean to say accelerators aren't useful, but it means that actually machine learning, artificial intelligence is just part of the main compute load that everyone is going through. It isn't something special. It is just the new, way, the new types of compute that we're doing using the same old hardware. And because we're using the same old hardware, that actually means we need to be worrying about the same old problems. Um, you know, things like buffer overflow, use after free, we keep on going on about them. John talked about the fact that um, um, the memory safety is a thing, a theme. It remains to be a theme. It's been around for the best part of 40 years, and it's not getting better. We've got things like Morello going on to try and make it better. We've introduced things like um, the memory tagging extensions, and we're working on Morello going forward precisely because memory safety remains to be the fundamental backbone of the hacker community's existence. They are... Um, they are continually finding these issues. And the, the interesting question there is, how does, AI, how does the emergence of AI and ML tools affect this? Because actually what you're going to see with things like the co-pilots and, and other bringing of ML and AI into our um, code analysis tools is, hey, great, all of the developers will actually have tools that help them identify memory safety issues and hopefully fix them. But wait a second. It's also that the attackers now have a powerful tool to go and analyze the millions and millions of lines of code that's dusty old code that's been out there. We've got to remember that memory safety issues have a really nasty habit of lying in plain sight. Heartbleed was in, um, in the code base for about two years before it was discovered, and it was kind of discovered by some security researchers, as I recall. The point is, if I've got ML that can crawl over the entirety of the world's code, what's the betting the hackers will use this to be able to find um, more vulnerabilities, be able to find, find things in old code? ML machines, artificial intelligence doesn't get bored, it doesn't get tired, it can just churn through the gazillions of lines of code that are out there and find vulnerabilities faster than human beings can go in and go and deal with it. And so actually AI will provide new vectors. Similarly, when you're trying to string together a set of gadgets as part of a ROP attack, you'll be able to use AI tools to be able to come up with new ways of, of using these attacks, new parts of data uh, that you can, of code that you can go and reuse. So, so I'm slightly rushing because I'm ridiculously behind time. Um, so, you know, fundamentally, it's going to be really important that we use tools like the memory tagging extensions that we put in there which essentially um, is now starting to be deployed in smartphones. It's going to be available in all of our A, -pro A profile designs going forward. And this will then allow people in gateways, uh, in industrial systems, to be able to, in real time, run a dress sanitizer. The, the whole principle behind 
uh, what we did with uh, adding in memory tagging uh, was to provide some hardware tools to, ex to accelerate um, address sanitizer to the point in which it can be used as a frontline security feature. It can be used to be continually scanning over code and looking for, for issues rather than looking for memory safety issues being something you do in the lab. And so it's going to be really, really valuable to keep on looking for these because the attackers will be looking for them as well. And it isn't just, obviously, in the area of memory tagging that we've added uh, more security features into the ARM architecture. Uh, we've got the realm management extensions, which we added in order to be able to secure um, data centers, to be able to secure your workloads on other people's hardware um, so that you can trust uh, what you're running on. And as people look to deploy their models out to the edge of the cloud, so um, confidential computing will actually move again from being a data center thing to being an important part of protecting the computing that is going on um, uh, at the edge, uh, protecting these highly expensive models that have been placed out there. Uh, we put in things like pointer authentication and, and, and the like and branch target instructions in order to be able to, again, provide um, better security against ROP and JOP. The basics of security with PSA certified, I'm sure you've all heard about this as a program, just to drive into, um, into microcontrollers, into a lot of IoT systems, um, a, a certification scheme to allow people to say, this meets the basic best practices of security. It isn't just been knocked together, but it's actually got a degree of certification. That's an important part of, again, the foundations of security. And all of this is going to matter more as the attacks come in from uh, AI and from ML, and as we've got to secure systems doing these things. And John's already talked about the Morello program. Um, and it is really good uh, that other people actually are building it. People might be surprised that I'm actually pleased that RISC-V, the CODASIP, have announced that they are doing a, a, an implementation of Cherry. The whole vision I've stood up before and talked about is that this is a technology, the Cherry technology, is something we want to see widely deployed. And the Morello program has enabled a lot of people to explore how this technology could be used to, again, address some of the fundamental security properties going, out, um, going on, uh, being able to create more compartmentalization, uh, be able to produce inherently more secure systems. And so to summarize, the, the basic story is, yes, we're in a transition phase. In the same way as when the internet appeared, um, the world changed. Now AI and ML has appeared. The world is changing again. We're all going to have to learn new skills. There'll be new attacks, new forms of attack. They, these will be enabled. And also the computing that we're doing will become even more central to our lives. And so the, in this era of AI, so the security of the internet of things, the security of the internet as a whole will become more and more important. Even more of our lives will be out there. Secure, the basic security hygiene that we've got things like PSA with caring about the boring stuff like uh, memory safety issues will become more and more important in this era of AI. And ARM is fundamentally committed to advancing security and to be advancing the technologies of AI going forward. So thank you very much. <laughs>